thank you all for inviting me to come and participate in this thing today. Uh, I look out and, and I see a lot of familiar faces. I got some classmates here, so if y'all, if they start harassing me, y'all know what they're doing, okay? They're just being good friends. <clears throat> uh, when I was going through that stuff, uh, uh, I've had, uh, I guess, a really great fortune of being involved with my university, my community, um, uh, for a long time. And the one thing that I will tell you that I ever got a chance to do over again, it would have been that time that I was a yellow leader at A&M, because all of a sudden I must have gotten a lot cuter, <laughs> because my social life just started going straight up, you know. <laughs> Every year when the new yellow leaders are elected, we have a luncheon. And I get to give them, and now it's called the advice. And the advice goes something like this. If you have a girlfriend, you need to have a conversation about the need to date other people because you'll never be this cute ever again in the rest of your life, so take advantage of it. <laughs> and they all come back and say, you know, Mr. Junkin, you were dead on right, I guarantee it. <laughs> well, the uh, program today is about something that is pretty near and dear to my heart, and that's the veterans articles that appear in the paper uh, each Sunday, hopefully they appear. Um, <clears throat> I've missed uh, two or three before because scheduling conflicts, snafus, and sometimes somebody got sick and just couldn't do the, the interview or whatever, and, and so from time to time we've had to miss them, uh, but uh, for the most part we try our best to have a story in each week. And before I came over today, <clears throat> Uh, I had one of my legal assistants who does types up the stories. I don't type. I dropped out of typing class my sophomore year in high school. So I write the stories by hand and she types them all up. And uh, I said, put the list together of, of how many stories we've done so far. Because I didn't really know. And uh, there are 168 individuals so far that we've done stories on. And uh, I, I'm, I'm just very pleased to, to have done that. I have people come up quite often and say, we really enjoy the article that appears each Sunday. And my response to them almost is always this, and that's that, you know, I get more out of it probably than anybody else because I get to be in the presence of these people and hear their stories firsthand. So it's a, it's a real joyful experience for me. And I know we got some today that were part of the stories. I got, Taylor Riddle, Dr. Pope, uh, Mr. Boykin, uh, let's see, some, I know there's somebody else I was trying to think of that, uh, that I saw here earlier. Oh, Dr. Starr here that, uh, okay. Oh, okay, Ms. Yen, good, good to see you, sir. Okay, uh, and, and I get to know these people. I mean, really, you know, we, we, we uh, not just a once and a forget them kind of deal. I mean, I get to really get to know these folks because we get to talk about some things that are pretty near and dear to their heart. One of the uh, things that people ask about is how did this start? <clears throat> and I got to tell you that for me, this veteran stuff started in 1992. After I got out of college, uh, like a lot of my classmates, we all took commissions because Vietnam was in full bloom at that point in time, and we went and served. And when I was headed overseas, I remember I flew out of San Francisco, and they had a demonstration going on, and it was about uh, uh, calling us baby killers and hope you die and all this other stuff. And it just, I thought, goodness gracious, you know, I, I was just scared to death like everybody else that was heading over to serve their country. And so we got back, there wasn't any joyful parades or anything else, and so it was just something that, in our country's attitude, that uh, you didn't profess your uh, experiences and stuff. You just kind of put it to the side. And so that's kind of what I did. I put it aside, went on with my career of uh, going to get my education finished and starting my career and raising my family and doing my job. Just kind of put that aside. And I did that until 1992. In 1992, I had an experience that probably has changed me personally uh, about this veteran deal, because that was the time I went to a meeting with the Association of Former Students. We had our summer board meeting in Washington, D.C. And for the first time, 
I went to see the wall. Now, if you're a Vietnam veteran and you've not been to the wall, you need to go. Because I will just tell you that when you get there, you're just compelled to reach up and touch those names. And, uh, and, I, and I did that. Uh, leaving the park, there was a little stand uh, that sold portraits and stuff, and there was a photograph of a guy who had a, put his, had his briefcase on the ground and had his coat draped over the briefcase and his tie was undone, and he was reaching up, touching uh, the wall. And you could see coming out of the wall on the other side a bunch of GIs. And my wife Marilyn said, that's you. And I said, yeah, I guess that is. And so what happened is, is that she bought that photograph, had it framed, and she and the girls gave that to me <clears throat> as their favorite veteran. That day, I made a promise to those guys that I would not forget them ever again. Because I'd pretty much done that. There are 11 of our classmates that never came back. One of my high school classmates, two of the men I served with in my company. And so I decided then and there that I was going to remember them, and I do. Every year I, I go to the Memorial Day thing, and I go by the guys' graves, on, I mean the <laughs> memorial on campus, a Veterans Day observance, I join the VFW, I join the American <coughs> Legion. But I got another chance to serve because of my friend Steve Beachy uh, asked me if I would serve on the park, Veterans Park Board, and I said, absolutely. Now, I wasn't part of the initial park that built, board that built the park, but I did come on shortly afterwards. And I've got to tell you, if, if you've not been to our <coughs> Veterans Memorial, I, I'm so proud of that place. Uh, I mean, you've got to go to Washington, D.C. to find something as nice as that. I mean, it's just a, just a fact. And we've got something to really be proud of. And so I was very honored to be asked to be part of this uh, board. <coughs> And one time, uh, one day at one of the board meetings, we, they'd just gotten through with the building, the initial part of the park, and they asked, said, you know, we need to have something that would keep the role of the park before the public view, <coughs> and, and, and this, something like that. And I said, well, I got an idea. And so I pitched the idea of the veteran's story. And they said, well, Bill, that's great. If you can get the eagle to donate the space, and somebody to write the articles. So I said, well, okay, I'm, I've written a lot of legal briefs, but I've never written a, a newspaper article. And, and uh, uh, so I went to the Eagle and pitched it to them. And they said, fine. And I'm just going to tell you, another, I'm putting another plug to The Eagle and the space they give up, they could charge folks. Based on legal announcements I put in the paper, probably 1522000 to bucks each week for that article. So they are be commended for the community service they do in allowing that to take place in the prominent place that it does, which is in sports page, which is the first thing I read. Uh, but anyway, uh, the idea came to me uh, because of, uh, of a thing, matter that I heard in church. Now, I go to First Baptist Church in Bryan, and for those who might be Baptists, there always is a building program going on, okay? And I always want somebody to come up and give a testimonial about why they think it's important and appropriate for them to give. Well, we had our last building program before we built the last church, and uh, uh, one of the speakers was a fellow named Dr. Luther Bird, and I don't know if you all know Dr. Bird or not. But Dr. Bird was a deacon in our church, but he was a preeminent cotton pathologist that existed in the United States of America. And the story he gave was that one day I was on my 24th mission in the early part of the war. We were bombing over Germany. And he said, if you survive 25 missions, you got to come off the line. And on that 24th mission, we were hit. And I realized that we were going to crash. And so I'm trying to hold the plane together so everybody can get off the plane. And everybody does, but before I can get off the plane, it, it blows apart in midair. He's knocked unconscious, uh, comes to falling through the air, realize what's happened, 
pulls his reserve chute, uh, and he managed to land, not safely, he injured himself, captured by the Germans, and spent the rest of the time in a POW camp in World War II. And I heard that, and I said, that needs to be recorded. That's, that, that needs to be put down someplace where people can see that and hear it and whatever. <clears throat> so that was part of the impetus for the deal. And I, I said, I know some folks that I think that I can go to and get some stories from. Because one of the things is I go to the business men's Bible class at, at First Baptist, which is basically called the old guys class. <laughs> And, and uh, I mean, I probably, I don't know how many of my, uh, my, Bible, my Sunday school classmates that I've done stories on, probably a dozen. Uh, and just, I'm just rem amazed that those men that I've got to church with and been around for so long had the stories that they had, you know. And I'll recount some of, some of those things for you in a little bit. But anyway, uh, I that went ahead and said, okay, let's do it. So we had a young lady that worked for our organization at that point in time, who was a journalism major, and uh, she said, all right, she would, we pushed her into writing the stories, and I said, I'll do the interview if you'll do the stories. And so we had the first set of interviews were done over at the former students' building, and we videoed those interviews so that we could send them to, uh, on to uh, Washington for their records. And so the, I did the interview, but she did the first three stories. Well, she had a boyfriend problem, and <laughs> had to leave town and so now then I'm left without anybody so it's it's since the fourth story on they've been me and I tried to copy what she did as best I could and 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 go on with this now the one thing I determined early on it should be their story and if you notice from the articles I might have an introductory paragraph I might have a connecting paragraph uh, and, but most of the time it's quotes because it's their story. And I also found out that after a while there are some people that, you know, like Taylor Riedel who's been in the public all of his life, and Mr. Boykin, they could they get up in, in front of a camera, and they professors, they could, they could communicate easily. But I found there are others that just couldn't. So I discontinued the uh, interview process where we're recording it, where everybody's together. Because some guys just got intimidated. And I go to their home, sit around their kitchen table, uh, look at their pictures uh, and, and all the things that they might have, and, that, and I start writing notes. And they start talking and I write notes. And I found that's the easiest way for me to gather this information. As, as soldiers to soldiers, you know? And, and to have those comments and things that we know about having served in a combat situation and just talking quite frankly about some of it. We make a point to not get into the blood and guts. But I'll tell you quite candidly, folks, war is about killing and dying. And that's what it's all about. But we leave a lot of that out of it. We try to leave the memories or the memories that you'd want to share in, not those that you wouldn't want to share in. So that's the, wh how we do it, and uh, uh, hopefully if I can get through with the interview this afternoon, uh, there'll be 169 uh, stories will be in the paper, and we're going to, people say, when are you going to stop? I guess when we quit having veterans. And in this community, I don't think that's ever going to happen. Our plan is we're going to continue to do World War II guys as long as we can. Uh, we're going to then evolve fairly quickly here to Korean guys, because they're not much younger than the, Korea, the World War II guys. And then from there to Vietnam and so on and so forth. But we're going to share the stories of the citizens of this community because we feel there are things that you need to know about that fellow you've lived next to all of your life and you thought you knew, but you really didn't. And that's what we're trying to do is communicate that story as best we possibly can. And <clears throat> so, uh, people have also asked, you know, what's, what are your thoughts about it after all this period of time? I will just tell you, my thoughts are this, that in this community, during World War II, whatever you can remember from history, we had somebody here that was there and participating in it at that time. I've just been amazed by that. 
I don't have anybody that was on the Enola Gay that dropped the first atomic bomb, but I got people that packed, loaded it, you know, and uh, it's everything you can think of. I will also tell you that uh, some of the stories and some of the experiences have just absolutely blown me away. The, the courage that it took for some of these folks to do what they did, it's just, it's really mind-boggling. You know, people think, and I've heard this a long time, that people want to live and die for their country. And I'll just tell you, that's, that's not the case. I'll just tell you what makes people do some of the extraordinary things that they did. And that is this, they were just doing their job. And you ask any of these veterans, why would you do that? It's my job, I did my job. But the thing of it is, I knew if they did their job and did it to the best of their ability, their guy on their right and the guy on their left would be safe. And that's why they did what they did. Wasn't because they were especially brave or smart. If they were real smart, they, would, they wouldn't have gone in the first place, you know. Uh, it was because they had that sense of commitment to their fellow soldier and the person they served with. And that's it. That's what made those guys heroes. And that will always be what makes guys heroes. <clears throat> it's not that anybody wants to get out there and expose themselves to danger. I'll tell you, it's just against human nature to do that. But it's good training and commitment to your fellow man and doing your job. And I think it's what's come across in the story so far. I hope it has because it certainly did to me. Another thing that I hope came across in the stories to you is the matter of faith that people had to have to get through these things. You know, it's not something we like to talk about on a public forum. And I've always been very conscious about not doing that myself. I mean, I'm, I don't know, I've just, I've not been the best witness I should have been in my lifetime. But I try to write every time that that becomes something that they are saying to me. And I make sure that I tell you about that because it was a difference maker in so many of the guys ever coming back was that reason. And they would give you full, they give full credit for that. So uh, other than that, that's the, that's the basis of the program and the story, uh, the, everything. If, if anybody has any particular questions, they're like, yes, ma'am, Ann? Tell us about the book. OK. We've been in the process of trying to get a book put together of this so that I can become a published author for the first time in my life. And, and uh, we are going to compile these stories in the process, compile these stories in a book that will be offered for sale as a fundraiser uh, for, the, for the memorial. And uh, we hope to have those available so that we were going to try to try our best to get it done before the last Veterans Day observance. We'll try to do it before leading up to this one so that there'll be a good marketing opportunity centered around Veterans Day. And so that's what we think. And there'll be a cutoff, whatever the publisher says that date is. So until then, until they give us that date, next week's story is in the, in the book, the first one, because we're going to do more than just that one. So any other questions from anybody? Yes, ma'am. The what now? The counterintelligence corps. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Uh, um, the counterintelligence, I, I knew that some, uh, one individual that was what was called with the OSS, which ne later became the CIA. Well, he was with whatever the first part was, and the OSS and, and, and on, but uh, 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 <clears throat> I've had, as I said, pretty much uh, everything. You know, one of the, one of the in individuals I, <clears throat> that I did uh, quite some time ago was, uh, uh, golly, Maximo Terrina, Terrina. And he, he landed, he was in the first wave that landed on Omaha Beach in D-Day. And of course, all of us had seen Saving Private Ryan. And after having seen that movie, I made the comment to 
one of my, my for good friends, uh, Charlie Wooten, if y'all remember Charlie. Charlie was a veteran of Guadalcanal. And I said, Charlie, I just don't know. I mean, I served in combat and everything. I just don't know if I'd have the kind of courage to do what those people did. And he said, oh, you do what you have to do. And I, I found out that's what you do. But he was on that first wave. And you saw the ramp fall down and the people in front. And, and, and he goes over the side and, and water over his head. And, and uh, the story, and I asked, I said, was it as bad as depicted? He says, it was about as accurate as you could possibly get. And I thought, war is definitely hell. No question about that. And, and the comment he made was, when I finally got through that first day and he survived, he said, if tomorrow is like today, I won't have many more. And that would have been exactly right. Fortunately, it wasn't. Fortunately, it wasn't. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Where in the local area will all of these be filed so that somebody 50 years from now can go through them? Uh, Ann, you want to answer that question? And I have a copy of every article in my office, too. So, yes, ma'am. I live a block away from Dick Davidson. I think you had to take two or three columns to tell his tale. Yes, ma'am. And all of that stuff I never knew about the man. And it's a wonderful introduction to a person that you don't even know about your next door neighbor or the person on the next street. That's, that's the whole purpose of this article. You, you find the experiences range from uh, just doing their duty to, to severe combat like Dr. Davison. And uh, yes, he was a placement unit that when it was all over and done, they were only uh, a handful of folks that he started with that were left. Uh, I know one of the stories I did on, on Okinawa of the whole Marine company that started, there were three <coughs> that finished, that started together, which to me is just amazing. The, uh, the casualties that, that they suffered, and for them to continue to do their job. I mean, just just doing that, after knowing that, is just enough for me. Yes, sir? I wonder if you could provide the list of those you've written about, perhaps to Ann. She could post the list on the website, and then we'd all know the names of the people you've written about. I would be glad to do that, be glad to do that. And let me just tell you this. People say, well, where do you, where do you get these people? from you. Uh, you call me. And every one of my veterans uh, have pretty much have, that I've done a story on have led me to another veteran. Uh, but I ask them to please tell me if there's anybody that they know that I should contact about this. And I keep a list of probably 15 or 20 people all the time. And I try to vary the story from Army Air Corps to Navy to Marine to whatever. And uh, so that's, that's how we try to do it. So please, anybody's got a name, call me. Yes, ma'am. Um, when I was in Michigan, I, I, was, I knew nothing about it, and I was honored to meet some Tuskegee Airmen. And I'm wondering, do you have any stories of them, or is there anyone in our community that we could <coughs> search out and, um, and get a story from? No, ma'am, I have a, the only story I had was a, was a gentleman that served with the Tuskegee Airmen in, in uh, Italy, and he, what his comments about them as a unit and what kind of a, a men of good character and courage they were. But no, ma'am, we don't have anyone. As far as black soldiers, uh, there were very few. They were limited uh, in their participation in the service, uh, plus Turner who was a councilman for the city of Collins Station, served in specific as an artilleryman, and his story appeared. And uh, what happened, but he was, there just weren't that many involved at that point in time, to tell you the truth. Yeah, Beth? There's um, 
Yes, ma'am. Have you any uh, women? Yet? Yes, we have. We have uh, one of the first three stories was uh, 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 Ms. Adams, Margaret Adams, who was an Army nurse. Um, we did uh, uh, Yolanda Kozlowski. We have done uh, 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 Ms. Goff, Carl Goff's mom, my classmate, his, his mom, who was an Army nurse. Um, Oh, I've done it about, about five or six. I can't, I'm, a couple of names are slipping right now, but I did one who was one of the ladies who ferried these planes wherever they needed. I forget the name of the organization. The WASP. Yes, one of the WASP was, was a lifelong member of it from this community. Uh, and their story, there was 38 of those women that died serving their country. Uh, Fortunately, she survived, but they flew every kind of plane there was. One of the stories I thought was pretty funny was this lady in her mid-50s, uh, family is raised, husband's reaching retirement, they lived in Connecticut at the time, but they're from Texas, and decides that she said, I'm going to go back and get my license active. And so she goes out to, to uh, get with the instructor pilot. And you can tell this guy was saying, oh, this old lady wants to learn how to fly. <laughs> and he says, see, so you've flown, what, what, you have experience? He says, well, let's see, B-27s, i got so many hours, and B-24, so many hours, and F fighter pilots, and P-18, and all these other things. He says, my God, where do you come from? Well, it's a wasp, you know? So... Uh, I thought that was a pretty, pretty good story, too. <laughs> yes, sir? One of my best friends passed away this past summer, so I know his story has not been told. Do you interview wives? He's no, because the story is about what happened to them, the people they saw, the, what they heard, the comments, the, their memories. And yeah, those stories, are sec but they're secondhand. And they just... You just don't get the feel for actually what happened. Uh, and it, it becomes me trying to interpret something about their involvement in the war, and I'd rather it be their story uh, than, than anything else. Any, yes, Beth? Uh, you said at first, the first few ones you did, you videoed and sent to Washington. Do you continue to send, do you continue to send what you print to Washington? Uh, we, we do. We're, we'll package it and send as we... Uh, Right. Well, the uh, Library of Congress has a, has a section where they'll keep the World War II stories. And uh, I think Haskell probably knows about that and stuff. But anyway, we, uh, we, we'll send those. And we'll get a bundle, we'll, we'll send them. And, and so that's the deal. Haskell? I see a member of our city council here. What about a city council resolution thanking the Eagle and you and all of the others who have participated? Well, you thank the folks, okay, you thank the folks that served and, and who let their stories be told, and you thank the Eagle for letting it done. But I'm going to tell you something. I, as I said, I get more out of anybody else. I, I mean, I just, I'm telling you, I do. And, and so that is, uh, that is my privilege, and I'm saying that clearly, privilege. Yes, Joe? Steve, Bill, have you uh, interviewed anyone that served with any of our Congressional Medal of Honor recipients <coughs> and those who served... With, uh, General Rudder, uh, I have not, and I and I I'm sorry I say I haven't found anybody yet that that did that. Now I have uh, guys that were Omaha and D Day, but nobody at, uh, with General Rudder's Rangers. Uh, I you know there are most of the but most of the units I have folks that have uh, been there. I've got more patent stories you can shake a stick at. <laughs> A lot of them you cannot publicize, okay? <laughs> Mr. Borkin. Well, uh, I visited the uh, Vietnam Memorial, and to me it was the most impressive of all that I saw, including the World War II uh, volume there in Washington, D.C. And, uh, and, of course, the Korean was impressive as well. But, uh, and I've read Maya Lin's book, how she designed this wall and all the things, the thought, the feeling she put into it. And it's there because you can see the names, you feel names. 
but you also see yourself when you look. And uh, I thought that's a most impressive thing. Now the disturbing thing is, there is a World War I monument there that nobody knows about, and it is in terrible shape. And I say, we need to go back in history again and revive our memories of World War I, which we had a big hand in, as you know. That's right. I agree with that. Yeah, Haskell. Congress in 1921, I believe it is, did a praise of college graduates, college former college students that served in World War One, and you get one guess as to which institution had the highest number of former students who served. I promise you it was this one. I promise you it was this one. You know, that's the other good thing too is if folks who were going to school here, it was pretty much an en masse, you know, induction into the military. But the other thing that I found is that so many people that a lot of the folks are so grateful for what happened after the war, and that was the GI Bill. That they got to go on to school and finish their degree and become professor and all this other stuff. And, it, and it's one of those things that I say that probably we need to continue for every veteran that serves. Uh, I know I went to law school on the GI Bill and a teacher's salary for a wife that taught. And, and I think that that's something we need to, to do. Well, folks, I, I've enjoyed very much. Uh, yes, ma'am? I want to know if you've interviewed anyone in the chaplain's service. You talked about the impact of faith. And then whether or not you've interviewed any Japanese soldiers that participated in the Second World War. Really what this is, it's not a historical search for the war. It's about the members of this community and the circulation area of the Eagle. And when I say this community, I mean last week was Gauz, uh, I, it'd be Grimes County, Madison County, Leon, all the other counties around, um, that uh, it's about their story, the people of this community. And uh, yeah, we could go out and probably search out hundreds of thousands of other people, but uh, you really want to do it for this. One thing I would say that I didn't realize was the, the impact the war had on the community of Caldwell. There were so many of those boys that were in the National Guard, they're activated in the 36th Division, which is the Texas Division. And at one point to a time, uh, they had a deal, it was like in 19, they were also the first Americans ever on European soil during World War II. They did the landing at Salerno. And, uh, at one point in time, after Salerno, I saw a headline in the Burleson paper that I got. There were 82 boys that were killed, wounded, or missing in action from Caldwell. And I thought, now that's a community that's serving, without question. So, I thank the yes, sir, Mr. Yannick. Yes, sir. Apparently what happened is they had a doggone good recruiter for the National Guard <laughs> that went through Burleson County and those guys need the extra money, you know, so <laughs> they, were, they were in the Army before they knew. As one guy said, a one-year commitment turned into five, so <laughs> thank y'all so much. Appreciate it.